Welcome to another episode of Focal Point. I am your host, Chris DeBoer, Executive Director of Reformed Perspective Foundation. In this episode, we continue on with our discussion with Jojo Ruba, the Executive Director of Faith Beyond Belief. In this part of the discussion, we explore how Christianity in general is responding to the challenge of homosexuality and same-sex physical attraction. How is it becoming accepted by much of broader Christendom? And what can we do about it? As well, we explore the blessing that counseling can be and has been to Christians who are struggling with homosexual attraction. So, enjoy this second half of my discussion with Jojo Ruba. Take care and God bless. So we have so much to be thankful for, eh? In God's grace. Absolutely. So that, and that's why we believe in grace as, as the church, and we should offer it. Yes. Right? And, and that, I appreciate your comments there, because it is, a, it is something that a lot of us in the church haven't thought of. And that's why the revisionists have filled that vacuum in. I can tell you, the woman who runs a ministry called Generous Spaciousness, uh, her name is Wendy Gritter, was, is a reform. I think her background is reform. And the, that is the largest revisionist organization mm. in Canada on this issue. And one of the, the things that uh, I did was I attended a conference a training session she did here in Calgary. In fact, she, uh, several of our Faith Beyond Belief uh, friends and Journey Canada, another ministry we work with, showed up to that. And Chris, what she's doing is she's training Christians, including pastors, to infiltrate their churches, to go back to their churches to bring a revisionist theology into those churches so they can be loving, and I'm doing air quotes here, uh, to LGBT people. And the only way to love them is to agree with them. Yeah. So th this is what's happening now. And if your church is not prepared to have these kinds of discussions, even if we don't always agree on every fine detail, uh, this is what you'll be facing instead. And I'm, see I'm seeing this in the next generation because we haven't talked to them about a, a better way of seeing sexuality. You know, just, just on your point, and I appreciate what you're saying. I, I think for me, what, what happens if, if I'm in a situation where I, I find myself attracted to another man, um, and I have to get to know that person because it's work or it's school or something, I realize as I get to know that person, and that person is no longer different from me, I see them as just like me, I realize they're just exactly like me, those attractions actually disappear. Okay. So, that that's part of where I'm coming from to help understand how to process this. If, if you're dealing with this yourself, you have someone in your family, you have to recognize th this, this sense of difference is such a key element yep. to what your, your per or your friend or your, your son or your daughter is dealing with in her life. And that's why it's important to be able to process that with them. Is, this is not, and this is what, what the point I'm trying to make. This is not a, something you think about. I, I can explain this to you now as an adult having gone through this. And I, by the grace of God, has stayed, has stayed chaste and celibate. And I've never, you know, lost myself, gotten off the deep end and all that. And I, I, I thank God for that. But having gone through that, if I talked to myself 30 years ago or 20 years ago, um, I, I wouldn't have been able to articulate this and, and to be able to, to help your audience understand this is what they're dealing with. So whether or not you consider the initial attraction sinful or not, what I think it's important to recognize is this is something a lot of people won't be able to control initially. And if you're a teenager, this is happening all the time. And, and so how do you process that? And that's part of where the church should really step in. Because we should really show what real love is. And that, that's what's been missing, Chris, is the, the love that, the, that Christ offers us is so, is, is so much more in depth. And think about it. Every one of these four loves we mentioned, right? friendship, love, family, love, uh, romantic love even, and, and God love, Jesus compares his relationship with the church using these four love needs, which tells me, and this is where my hope is, is that I may not have all of these love needs met this side of heaven, yep. but I know in heaven we will. Right. And in fact, I think, frankly, that's one of the reasons why there is no marriage in heaven, because we all have such an intimacy with each other and with our God 
that there's no need for that kind of intimacy here. It would just pale in comparison. But it's available to us now so that we can know the passion love, Jesus calls romantic love, passion love, that God has for us. Right. No, absolutely, brother. And um, George, I, you, you throughout our presentation, discussion rather, um, today, you've talked about the revisionists and, and the, yeah, kind of the organized effort by different right. ministries to tell us that we need to affirm uh, people who identify as LGBT, that the church needs to, um, yeah, endorse and, and uh, advocate for uh, brothers and sisters who identify this way. Uh, I actually came across something called the Reformation Project, which is... Ironically called, yes. Yeah, I, I find it really disappointing, to be honest. <laughs> but they would, they would actually suggest that their work is akin to Luther. Right. And that they are going to instruct uh, churches and pastors like the, the ministry you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. to, to affirm these things and that by their fruit, you should know them, that by their fruit, if, if you affirm uh, same-sex relationships, same-sex sexual relationships, that the fruit is good. But if you deny them this opportunity to experience this, then the fruit is depression and, and even maybe suicide. So the fruit is bad, uh, which, nice. of course, is, is really a perversion of Scripture. Uh, Jojo, I guess my question for you at this point would be how... How, how should we, uh, yeah, let me, uh, it seems to me that the church can't compromise on this issue. That if, 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 if Christians like the Reformation Project and the one that you mentioned are promoting such ungodly lifestyle, it would seem to be evidence of a lack of godliness and a lack of, of, um, honoring Christ as king. So how can we equip ourselves to engage in this battle that is being waged actually within Christendom? Yeah, and, and that's really where we're at now. The culture has already gone all the other way around. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a very long time for us to turn that around. Uh, of course, great, by the grace of God, we can. I'm not giving up on that by any means. It's going to be a lot of work. When we talk about what's happening in the church, though, that's the problem. Wholesale denominations and uh, churches are splitting on this. People are leaving the church. Uh, Bart Campolo, he, he's the son of famous Baptist pastor Tony Campolo, became an atheist. He we actually had us speak at our conference a few years ago. And one of the points he made is that progressive Christians, and these are people who take a left-wing approach on many issues, but particularly, this is the crux, this, this issue is a huge one for them. They take those positions, uh, and he says 40% uh, of them become atheists anyway. But, but all of this stems from the, what, what Scripture warns us, that people will call evil good and good evil. And so their, their motivation is actually in, that they're doing good things, that they think they're being good people when they do this. And it goes back to even the, the start of your question there. Should we affirm LGBTQ people? Well, yeah, of course. We should welcome anyone at our church. But the debate is not about whether, whether we welcome the people. The debate is whether we welcome the identity, the behavior, the actions that come with people. And, and this is what's happened at Trinity Western. This is happening at many, many different churches, schools. This is what's happening with the uh, conversion therapy ban that we're talking about. Here in Alberta, what they've basically said in these municipal bylaws is if you're same-sex attracted like I am and want to get counseling, you have to embrace a gay identity. You cannot get any counseling, even if you just want to stay celibate and not act on your feelings. Why? Because you are defined by your sexual attractions. And so the people who have this, these projects, the Reformation Project particularly, was started by a guy named Matthew Vines, who was, who was going to go to Harvard and said he started this organization. And he actually does what we do, but on the other side. So they take people, they do training conferences, where they go through what they claim their six Bible verses that talk about homosexuality, and none of them uh, actually directly um, uh, address homosexuality. 
they, they it talks about pedophilia or prostitution, but not the homosexuality. So, and, and they come off and like you said, they, they say, if you don't accept LGBT people and what they mean is by their behavior and what they do identify as, then you have bad fruit because you're not loving everybody. And their stated goal is to change the whole church, particularly the reform evangelical Protestant church to become affirming. And then that way we'll truly be loving people. So that's the context. And by the way, just, just so you, you familiar with the terminology, I was at a, a, the largest gay Christian conference called Q Christian Conference of Chicago last year. And uh, they use terms called side A and side B. And side A are people like Matthew Vines who completely said the Bible endorses homosexual practice. We can identify any way we want to because that's God affirms you and the identity that you have. I would add you've chosen because you may not choose your attractions. You can choose your identity. In this case, that's what, what that is. Side B people are people who identify as gay, bisexual, transgender, or whatever, but they don't act on it because they think the Bible says don't act on these things. But they both come to this conference and meet. Right. So here's what's interesting that happened at the conference. Uh, I think there are about 2,000, 2,300 people there. And me, so I, I was the only one. Like, I'm, I'm not there to argue. I'm going to be sort of outnumbered. And uh, of the 2,300 people, about 44 or so were side B. The wow. rest had already become side A. Yeah. And there was a side B speaker. And there's a tension there right now between the two, because the side B people are supposed to be welcome in the side A conference but they're becoming less and less. So there was a side B pastor who showed up, a young man, left a Chinese church, became a pastor, a different church, because he identifies as gay, but he chooses to be celibate. He also spoke at what's called the Revoice Conference. And again, I'm just giving you some terms, so if you want to look them up. And Revoice is basically side B people. They started their own conference. And what, what he, this young man said is that the reason why side A people should work with side B people is because side B people can get into churches like ours because they have the right theology and then op open the door and make space for side A people to join the church later on. Right. So it's sort of a stealth mode here. What they consider us, those are people who reject same-sex sexual identity or gay identity and say that's not compatible with scripture, as I've argued, we're side X people. So oh. <laughs> we're all the way up the bottom of the alphabet kind of thing. But, but the point that I th and the reason why I'm trying to raise this yep. is because our churches need to be very, very aware of these kinds of theologies, because it actually, frankly, speaks broadly to our lack of biblical uh, consistency. Yep. Uh, in fact, it, goes, it speaks to, let me just say two things. So in our responses, we need to know the truth of what we believe, the yep. biblical facts, the historical facts, the, fa the fact that we're talking about now. One of the key lines that I, I, I'm, I'm looking at, and one of the reasons why uh, I think it's so important for us to mention these, this sense of attraction is because if God designed these four love needs and they're, they're not, they're not uh, interchangeable, right? you can't have a friendship love and change, exchange that with a parental love. Right? Those two are different kinds of loves. That means that these love needs will never be fulfilled by these other love needs. Right. So what ends up happening in gay male relationships, Chris, is uh, even like the numbers can be high as 90 percent. I've seen 40 percent. There's a high, high rate of these men who are married to other men who have open relationships. Right. They're, because they're, they're searching for that masculine intimacy through sex, but they can never find that because it's not defined or not designed that way. C.S. Lewis talks about how, again, and I like how he, he described it in The Four Loves. He says, uh, friendship love is two people walking side by side, working, walking towards the same goal or direction. So it's side by side love. Yep. Romantic love is when two people walk towards each other, become more and more like each other. So it's coming toward love. Yep. And if you think about that spatialness of that kind of love, that means these loves will never actually work together that way. It doesn't mean you can't be your wife's best friend. It just means it's a different kind of love your wife offers than your buddies. And, and I think it's intuitive and that's why you're happily married, Chris. I mean, you tell me, 
I think even happily married people need some time where they need guys night out or boys night out or they have a ladies breakfast together, right? And our, our churches do that. That's why we have men's fellowship and women's fellowship. And, and a happily married couple recognizes you need to encourage that of your spouse because there's a different love need that their, their same-sex friends offer, right? So the, the point with that is because this is designed in, in, by God to be met through non-sexual ways, people who are trying to meet this need for same-sex intimacy through sex will never actually have that need fulfilled. Right. So that's just, I think that's just logical. I think it makes sense. Yeah. And, and that's one of the ways we can help young people who are dealing with these questions to, to show them the second thing, which is not only is the biblical view true, the biblical view is good. In, in other words, it's, it's actually the thing that the, leads us to the best kind of life that leads to human flourishing. I mean, literally, we can't have humans without a natural view of sexuality, right? And, and when we think of it that way, we begin to see what the real challenge is right now. The real challenge by these revisionists, like the Reformation Project, and their I talk of fruit, is that they think goodness means letting people do whatever they want, right. or letting anyone choose whatever identity they want. For, for us, the, the term I'm using in, in my, my research, in contrast to the revisionists, is what I call the, the redemptive view of love. Right? Every, what it says is every aspect of our identity, including our sexuality, needs to be redeemed by Christ. And so we can't speak to, of it as if it's this pure, untouched um, part of our identity. When, when I was at this gay Christian conference, I listened to bishops and pastors and counselors and all kinds of people. And Chris, not one person off the stage or in the breakout sessions discussed how their sexuality was tainted by the fall. Right. Not one. They just assumed it was untouched by the fall. And I just thought that was the most weirdest Christian experience ever, uh, quote unquote Christian, because yeah. how can that be Christian? Right. So in contrast to the revisionist view of love, what we need to offer to the church and to our, our followers or believers or brothers and sisters in Christ is a redemptive view that says God has to redeem us, every aspect of us, including our desires and our attractions. And so to respond to these, this Reformation project, these side A and side B kind of conversations, is we need to show them that the biblical view of sexuality is actually better. So there's a, there's a line that Gandhi coined that um, he stole from Augustine, uh, where he said, you have to hate the sin, but love the sinner. And, and, and the way we say that is we have to hate the sin because we love the sinner. And I, I think that's the case for God. He hates the sin so much. He hates any sin so much because he loves people so much. And he wants to save us from those, those sinful desires, sinful nature. And, and I, I, I really think, um, and this is the last point because I've gone out a little bit here, is that the church has to do, the church can respond in, in multiple ways to this issue. They can take the revisionist approach and, and adopt the cultural view of love, which, which is frankly shallow. Uh, and, and no one actually believes that because as soon as you disagree with these people, they stop loving you, right? And it becomes an, you, bec they become, you become their enemy and it's no longer about love. Uh, and then there's the opposite approach, which is that anyone who struggles with these feelings and attractions, the church labels as gay and either kicks them out, harms them, like all, all kinds of things. And that's where this conversion therapy ban is trying to address, I think, in a clumsy way. Right. But, but I think the Jesus approach is very good. Like when, when he, and I bring this story up all the time, it's very powerful for me and, and as I read it. When he's at Simon the Pharisee's house and this woman comes in to wash his feet with her hair and her tears. And Simon's initial reaction is, if Jesus only knew the kind of woman this was, he wouldn't even let her touch him, which, which most scholars presume has to be some sort of sexual sin, because it's about touching, it's about the untouchable woman. And, and in that passage, Jesus never addresses or sees her through a sexual identity. Right. It's, a, it's a very powerful truth because everyone else does, including herself. But Jesus does address her sin 
and then gives her a new identity, one of a forgiven child of God. Yeah. And, and that thrill as she must have left that house, realizing all these people may think these terrible things about me, but Jesus no longer does. That's what I think young people need to hear from us, that we can offer and we have a better identity in Christ. Yeah, amen, brother. Like, really, uh, and, and I think as adults, we need to be aware of these revisionists and of the Reformation <laughs> Project That's right. because our young people have access to the internet and they can find these things and they can be be taught Absolutely. that this is good and that this is healthy and that this is um, part of who you are uh, in, in, a, in, in a certain sense. And if we're not aware right. of these false teachers, and I think we should call them what they are. Um, Absolutely. If we're not aware of their work, that we can't also be aware of their influence. And I That's think right. that these, these um, false teachers will have a, a great influence because of the online presence. And when our young people are struggling, uh, we, need to, uh, uh, we need to help them find good resources and not um, these ungodly ones. And so your point about, you know, the church labeling them as gay and writing them off, I think one of the key elements in our discussion here has been the reminder, I think we know it, but we sometimes forget, we fall into the same trap as the world, and that is we are not identified by our sexuality. The church ought not to identify anyone in the church by their sexuality, and that therefore we need also to uh, assist our brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling with same-sex sexual attraction. Right. right. That this is not a write-off and we should not label them or, uh, in, with an identity that is not theirs. Can, can, I, just are, say yeah. can I just say something to that? Because that's really key, especially if you have kids. Um, just affirming their masculine or feminine identity Right. And saying, I'm like you, is such a powerful thing. It's extremely helpful. Okay. So yeah, your, your son may like playing with girls' toys, or your, your daughter may like playing with boys' toys, or whatever, right? That doesn't matter. It's not the, ex those are just external things. Yeah. It's having them understand that they may express themselves in this way, but they're still designed by God as a man. Yeah. And that they, you can affirm them. I mean, if you if you think about that, that part is true. There's a lot of social construct, like the color blue or the color pink. That's the one I'm talking about. You need to help those kids understand you're like me, if you're the dad, if you're a boy, and I'm like you. And if you're the opposite sex parent, you need to do the same thing too. They need to see you affirming their masculine or feminine identity from the opposite sex. Right. That That is so helpful to affirm that, to get, let them know that, yeah, you can be a boy and become, you know, an, an interior designer or whatever. You can be a girl and become a mechanic. That doesn't really matter. What it means is you're a girl who likes mechanical things. So what? Yeah. And to, to make that accessible. And frankly, that's for adults who might be in your church too, Chris. If you know that someone's struggling with same-sex attraction, one of the key things they really need is healthy, intimate, same-sex friendships. Right. And if we as a church can offer that, that's one way that they can meet some of that need uh, under helping them understand, what, like I said, that they're, they're actually not different from you. And, right. and if you can help them see that, the, the attraction of the a Reformation Project and Wendy Gritter and generous spaciousness, uh, that will not be as attractive because now they have actually an alternative model of seeing healthy intimacy. So, oh, Georgia, if we can now turn a little bit as we uh, bring this uh, discussion to a, a bit of a close. Sure. You've, you've experienced same-sex sexual attraction. You've had to struggle with it. Um, and then you get help from, I think, from faithful Christians uh, to help you deal mm -hmm. with that, that struggle. Um, so can you outline for us what are the things... That, that you've had to go through and what, what has helped you mm -hmm. to um, live your life according to God's word rather than to uh, succumb to the temptations of the flesh? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, this whole counseling ban that they're trying to, to do is, is, is created on the assumption 
that and this is the, the actual phrasing of these laws and the federal law is the same by the way chris that any kind of reduct any kind of counseling or method that includes prayer that's aimed to reduce uh non-heterosexual attractions or behavior so any pastor who prays for a child the, the federal law deals with underage kids but a child can mean a 17 year old so if you pray for a 17 year old girl that she's not going to want to have sex with another 17 year old girl that is now conversion therapy under the federal law and you can go to jail wow in the calgary law and the alberta bylaws that have been passed there's no distinction uh between adults and kids so as a consenting adult i can't get this counseling either uh, and, and that that's something that's so egregious that that violates all kinds of laws. I think that's the reason why the federal law only deals with kids because they recognize they can't do that. But in places like Fort McMurray, their bylaw is so broad, Chris, I actually was there. Um, their own lawyer was asked by a city councilor, does this bylaw affect conversations with con uh, with, that I have with my own children, my underage children? Yeah. And their lawyer said, I can't say that it won't. Wow. And these and two counselors, the one who asked the question, she and another counselor voted against this law because of what their lawyer said. But the rest of the council still voted for it. So if you're in, in the Fort Mac area, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are no longer, according to their bylaw, allowed to have sexual conversations with your own kids about how they should not engage in non-heterosexual behavior. Wow. So in, in terms of that, um, I, you know, part of it, to be honest, is that I've never embraced and I still don't embrace the label gay. I don't think of myself that way. It's, right. it's not a healthy right. thing to label yourself through sexuality. Uh, I realized growing up that I was, uh, that there was an attraction there to people of the same sex. But this is where, again, the term attraction is hard because when you're young, you don't see that as a sexual attraction. There, there's, a, I, I, there's a longing to be, I want to be with the other boys and have them accept me kind of thing. But because that feeling was not um, resolved in any kind of healthy way, those attractions became sexual when I turned in my, when I got into my teens. Yeah. And that's why these terms are hard to define, right, Chris, without revisiting that, that concept. Yeah. And those, those uh, attractions, and I even remember I had fantasies of just being friends with these people. It wasn't sexual fantasies. It's just like, I want to be intimate and close and have these people respect me and like me. And, and as I grew up, those fantasies became sexual. So I, I could actually see the progression of how that happened. But uh, what, what happened with me was I have a very loving family that's accepted me that, that these, these issues we need to talk about more, but we're not like there. I always knew I was safe with them. And, and part of, part of the, the reason why I can stay a Christian was because I know it's true, right? The, um, the, the, uh, the apologetics that I teach, you can't escape morality, you can't escape creation. These are presuppositions that we, ha we have to make because they are reality, right? There, there's, there's truth, there's logic. We presume moral goodness. Even the atheist has to try to explain why we ought to be moral. And, uh, and when they sound amoral, they still have to use moral language. Right? It's all kinds of things like that. But, but as, as I realized these attractions were not going away and that there was a label that our culture was putting on them, I went to see a Christian counselor. And not all of them were great. Not all of them gave me good advice. But it was helpful to know that that opportunity for help was there right. to help me process this. And one of the, the key lessons I learned through that was this doesn't have to be my identity. Yeah. This doesn't have to define my reality. I've dated girls. And, and one of the I dated a girl for a long time, in fact, and one of the first things I did in our, well, actually, it is the first thing I did before I asked her out was to talk to her about where I'm, where I'm at, yeah. so there was no shock or surprise, and, and, and we, we still went out, so that was a good thing, we were dating for many years, so the, the, uh, the challenge as I went through all of this was it takes a long time to process, yeah. but at the end of the day, I, I was confronted with, is this something that I want to make my identity? Is this something I choose to define myself? And so especially when I was struggling with, with someone I was really attracted to who was male and realized, you know, if I truly love this person like I think I do, then we've read that love, real love in, 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 in C.S. Lewis is about wanting the best for that person. 
And the more I thought about that, the more I realized it's whatever I can offer in any kind of, you know, relationship, the best thing I can always offer is Jesus. So that really helped me understand the nature of love. And then here's the thing that, that happened, Chris. God offered and reminded me that he loves me in all of the ways that we need. And that those, these loves may not always uh, come out the way we expect this side of heaven, but that we can have that relationship with a real God who meets our needs and who will meet our needs uh, perfectly. So that that part of why part of, part of why I, I defend this worldview that we have, yeah. because I know it's true and it, it it actually is good. It offers something better than what our culture offers, and and I, I think I've given you some of the tools I've talked about already. But but even understanding the need for for same sex intimacy and th- that that's a good thing. That helps neutralize, especially for someone struggling with this, the, the idea that they have to feel guilty for wanting to be intimate with people of the same sex, because it gives them a chance to understand there is a healthy way to express that and an unhealthy way to do that. And, and once, we, once those healthy ways are being met, the, these, these other unhealthy ways have no place. So there's, a, there's an Australian guy who actually speaks, he was openly gay, had all kinds of relationships, was married or had a, a, like a husband kind of figure. Yeah. Uh, Parker is his last name. And he actually wrote this, Chris, and this was very helpful for me, even just reading it recently, because I think it enca- encapsulates so much of what we're dealing with here. He said he, he went through counseling as, because he had become a Christian, not necessarily wanting to deal with the sexuality part, but it came out as he was having these conversations. And he realized in his gay relationship that he was striving or looking for the masculine in his husband, in his boyfriend, and he could never find it in himself, and, but his boyfriend was looking for the masculine in him. Yeah. And so it could never actually be fulfilled because they were looking for something that they didn't see in themselves. Yeah. And as he went through this counseling, he began to realize that uh, that, that could never be met that way and, and that he didn't have to meet it that way. And as he was dealing with the, the sense of masculine brokenness, he actually struggled with, with transgender feelings as well. Yeah. Uh, he, he, the phrase he used was, the, um, the mystique or the uniqueness or the difference he saw in other men began to diminish and his attractions to women began to grow because now he realized they were the ones who were different from him. Yeah. But he couldn't get there until he saw himself as masculine, right? So uh, I, I bring that up because I, I say not everyone who deals with this will come through that way. Right. But it, it makes sense to me that in, even in my experience, right, the, the, there is still process. And, and that's why this whole, as we started off with saying, you know, this doesn't have to identi- identify you. And, and frankly, I think the Bible is very clear. There's no temptation that's not uncommon to, yeah. to humanity. And because we're all in process, uh, we can trust that God is perfecting us uh, and becoming, conforming us to the image of his son. So for me, that, that's what I look forward to. And that's what's helped me to know that I don't have to be perfect in all of this now, but God is perfect to me and will one day do so. No, I think that that takeaway message is the identity. Like somehow we've, we've got this identity with our sexuality that somehow we've bought into that. Right. Um, and I think your point is right on. I, I would encourage our uh, audience and our brothers and sisters in Christ, when you have someone that you know is going through this challenge, um, I think coming alongside, not being afraid, um, uh, you know, being a male, not being afraid of someone who has another male who has same sex uh, attraction, um, but also coming alongside, allowing yourself to have that intimacy, that, that relationship as mm-hmm. brothers in the Lord, and recognizing that his sexual attractions don't identify him. That doesn't make him who he is. I have no stones to throw to him either. I have my mm-hmm. own sins and my own temptations. And, and together, like you say, being perfected by, by Christ, by the Holy Spirit. 
I think that really is, is crux. Also, when we have to help our young people deal with it, like the right. world around you is telling you that you're identified by these feelings that you have. Right. Um, well, in fact, you're not, you're identified, you belong to Christ and that makes all the difference. Yeah. If I could just say, I really appreciate the apostle John. Mm. If you go through his gospel, almost all the time he describes himself. He describes himself as the apostle that Jesus loved or the disciple that Jesus loved. Yeah. And th that tells me something. Our culture defines ourself by who we love. Yeah. The Bible describes herself by who loves us. Yeah. And if you, if you think about the, the, the standard there, the feelings that we have, even the attractions of love, quote unquote, that we have, those change all the time. Yeah. But God's love is unchanging. So the question we need to ask our young people ourselves is who would you rather define you? Someone whose feelings always change, whose attractions always change, even if it's you, or the God who's never going to change and who will always love you more than you can ever imagine. Right? And that's what's the saving grace here because when we talk about the Christian story, the Christian story tells us of the, the, the God who rescued us and who saved us because he loves us. That's what real love is. And that's what this culture can never offer. No, no, it's so true. And I, and you know, there's a lot more you can unpack, uh, mm -hmm. Jojo, uh, you can talk about the emasculating of masculinity in culture. You could talk about Absolutely. Uh, the relationship between a husband and wife and the command to love your wife is, Absolutely. is huge. And, um, you know, but I'm, I'm really thankful to you that we could have this discussion today on um, same-sex sexual attraction, the importance of identifying ourselves as, as God identifies us by who loves us rather than who we love on a horizontal level. Um, and then your own personal journey, you know, your courage to uh, be willing to share in order to help brothers and sisters in Christ um, help each other. Um, you know, sometimes we ask, Lord, why do you give me this burden? Or why do you give me this thorn in my flesh? Or why? And one of the reasons, Jojo, can be so that you can help others. Right? And so uh, yeah. this uh, I want Absolutely. to thank you, brother, and wish you the Lord's continued blessings. For sure. Thank, Thank you, Chris. And if I could just say, uh, Chris, can I just say one thing here? If people have any more questions, yes. uh, we have a project called the Identity Project. It's 13 lessons we actually wrote for kids, but you can go through it as adults. Our friends at ARPA went through it as well, actually. And it actually goes through all of these lessons in a more detailed way about identity, about love, about the nature of husband and wife and male and female. You can find that on our website, faithbeyondbelief.ca. And if you do have questions on these issues, maybe you, you're going through these um, things as a church. Tell, I'll tell you, Chris, I actually get questions almost every couple of weeks from pastors, from individuals, from family members asking for help on this issue. So right. uh, feel free to contact us on the website as well, faithbeyondbelief.ca, and we'll see what resources we can offer for you. All right. Thanks so much, Jojo. Take care. God bless. God bless. Take care.